the narrator, you know. So this is kind of what Proust does in in A la recherche du temps perdu. Here's a little a little just a little glimpse of, of the subtlety of Proust's mind. And this is about one of his first early love affairs. He fell in love with this girl called Marie. Uh, she was the daughter of a Polish aristocrat, Bernardaki. And they lived in the same part of Paris. And as they were only about 13 years old, they would meet after school and, and with a group of their playmates. And they would play chasing games or sport games or running games. But often they would just talk and walk around the Champs Elysees. They were they were in the gardens of the Champs Elysees, and Proust would often quote poetry. He could memorize Musset, Hugo, Racine, Lamartine, and Baudelaire. And his little companions were quite impressed. A thirteen-year-old boy. Um, I have to say that's the same age I decided I wanted to become a poet as well, um, and. Marie was his, the, one of the loves of his life. She was a gorgeous uh, little girl. And he wanted, yeah, he, he, he played the lover to her. Um, <clears throat> every evening before he went to sleep, he would say to himself, I shall see her tomorrow. And if he woke in the small hours, he would fall asleep again with the thought, it's already today. As he lay in bed, he promised himself that tomorrow he would make a decisive step in his love, or at least memorise the elusive details of Marie's face. But when tomorrow came, the afternoon would pass in the insignificant ritual of the game Prisoner's Base, and her face would have changed. He measured his pleasure in seeing her by the immensity of his desire to see her. He wrote afterwards in a fiction for Jean Santori. And by his grief at seeing her go, for he enjoyed her actual presence very little. Sometimes in the Champs Elysees he felt that the little girl he saw was somehow a different person from the little girl he loved. Such are the characteristic symptoms of romantic love, which loves not a person, but an ideal, a personified desire, a projection of oneself. You know, it's a hard lesson to learn when you're 13, um, but we all do. And what's so interesting about Proust is he writes it all down, he kept the notes, he kept the diaries, and he turned it into this epic novel, which is really like the story of every man and every woman. Um, so, that's a little glimpse of Proust's self-reflection. I want to read a poem now from um, a wonderful anthology, Orpheus and Jesus. Orpheus is one of my spiritual heroes. He was... Um, if you read the chapter in um, Edward Schurer's great masterpiece um, um, about you know the, the the secret traditions, the secret teachings of all the different ages, he has a, an amazing chapter on Orpheus, and then one on Pythagoras. Um, and Schurer lived in 19th century France, and um, working from scholarship and, and what was known about Orpheus, but also what was known about um, his mystical traditions, which had come down, you know, esoterically. Shuroe was also very interested in Druidry as well. And there is a link between the Orphic mysteries and the Druid mysteries. Anyway, this anthology um, was produced for the Struga, Struga Poetry Evenings in Macedonia, or Northern Macedonia, as we now have to call it which I attended in the late 90s. And I met a lot of amazing poets there. I, I also read some of my poetry. And that's where, as I say, I founded the Order of Wandering Peace Poets, um, Bards and Druids. This is a poem by um, 
a Macedonian poet called Blaget Koneski. It's called the Pistol. Without you, Tyre and Sidon, they lived here for ages and will live again. We people are like grass. We are stomped, dried, crushed, killed. Only the earth remains. We people are like ants. We are squashed and exterminated, yet a pile collects. Through here, once, passed an expedition to the Indus. Who could have foreseen it? Along the Via Ignatia, Cicero went into exile to Salonica. Near Drama, the ghost of Caesar called on Brutus in a tent before the decisive battle. At Tiveriopol, fifteen martyrs were consecrated. Naum built a monastery at the source of the White Lake. This land also sustained King Marco. And still, has it not suffered humiliation? Can it achieve fullness without it? All is ordained. We go on. But the earth remains. And coming up towards the end now, I want to read two more things. One is from a collection of Old Testament pseudepigrapha, um, which are ancient writings that didn't get into the Bible. I think they ought to have done. And in my view, a lot of the writings of um, you know, the Old Testament should be supplemented by these writings, which include, of course, the most important of the three books of Enoch. And I'm a great fan of the three books of Enoch, which are, in parts, very poetic. They're very um, cosmic in their visioning. Um, however, they were excluded to the impoverishment, I think, of biblical studies. And... I'm working on a commentary on the Quran, and there's a whole discussion in Islamic poetics and, and philosophy and literary studies. You know, what is the genre in which the Quran is written? Is the Quran a sort of a sort of semi-poetic utterance? Is it a sadj, which is the term for one of the forms that the Quran takes, and which were were used by what were called the Kahin? Um, in the day of um, the writings. So, in my commentary I go into all that, and what I argue is that, that okay, so the Quran came from a place where the seer, or the sage, has to, has to go up to the collective intelligence, the divine intelligence, transcendent to your ego, your even your even the, the mind of the soul, you have to go to a deeper place, a spiritual place, which is the mind of the cosmic soul, which is the mind of God ultimately. And you can't stay there all the time. You know, you have to just go and snatch a few a few thoughts and then you can then enwrap them in the language of your time and place. Um, when I say that I can remember what it was like to be conscious before I learned to speak, I'm talking about that, that place of what is pure consciousness, which is, I think, where the soul comes from. Um, now, Muhammad had the ability to do that, and so did some of the other prophets. I think, I think we can understand that perhaps Abraham had that faculty. Moses seems to have had that faculty. And the, I think we should approach these writings, therefore, with awe 
and trembling, as Kierkegaard would say, because they record the, um, you know, the wisdom that that belongs to us all, but we have to um, we have to claim it, as it were. And I want to read from the Apocalypse of Abraham what is called a song or a poem, and it stands alone. Now this Apocalypse of Abraham was written, it's thought, sometime after the destruction of the Temple in Jerusalem, after the terrible civil war, probably in the early 120s AD. Um, and it visualizes, I mean, it retrospectively visualizes Abraham going to heaven and seeing the judgment of souls. And then it predicts the, the judgment that is going to come on earth if we don't live according to the moral codes of the one true reality. So it was around for about 400 years before Muhammad, and yet Muhammad's Quran is, in a sense, a continuation of this vision. Because in the desert, of the sources of Muhammad's Gnostic, esoteric, Christian melange with elements of the Kabbalah, elements of primal Arab wisdom, I've tried to unpick all that in my commentary on the Quran. I've done it as a poetic commentary, as a philosopher and historian, drawing on all those different disciplines to try and explain the Quran in a way that makes sense, because what I'm trying to do is diffuse the wars of the Middle East. I don't want my Muslim brothers and sisters to fight a single war again. When America leaves Afghanistan, I don't want any more wars in Afghanistan. I want them to love each other to make peace with each other, and to make peace with all other countries and nations. That can only happen if we truly understand what Islam is, and that can only happen if we go back to the sources. If we read this Quran again as if afresh, with new eyes, as if we're starting out at the beginning. And, and we have to read it with, with all the apparatus that we can now command of history, archaeology, literature, philosophy, and, and poetics. And one of the things we can do is look at the antecedents to the Quran in the Gnostic writings and in the um, you know, uh, apocryphal writings. And this is one of the important sources, the Apocalypse of Abraham, which most scholars ignore, bypass. You know. um, <clears throat> but I think it's important, and I'm sure that Muhammad was read parts of it in his travels in the desert. Muhammad studied and went to, during his long apprenticeship as an apprentice seer, he was working for Khadija as, as her kind of line manager for desert trading. And she was a very wealthy woman. She would have sent him trading. We know to Damascus, but I'm sure also to Hira, which was another very important trading city, uh, the capital of the Lakhmid kingdom, on the way to Persia. And also, I'm sure, to... Um, to Edessa, which is now called San Lerfa in southern um, eastern Turkey, which is the birthplace of Abraham. Of course Muhammad went there, you know, like a, like a spiritual pilgrim or tourist, if you want, um, and probably also doing some trading. It was an important city. I also am pretty sure he went down to the Yemen. This is all indicated by, by a close, detailed reading of the Quran. It's not in the conventional biographies, but then Ibn Ishaq didn't write the first biography of Muhammad for 200 years after his death. That's a mystery. Why? You know, um, discuss. There's, there's, there's some really interesting research coming out at the moment, but um, I think the trouble was that, that Islam was overswept by a, a malfeasance of tradition, the Umayyad dynasty, were interested in suppressing truth and not encouraging questions. They were a military takeover coup done against the authentic Islamic tradition that was represented by Muhammad and Ali. The people that became the rulers of the Umayyad dynasty were the enemies and foes of Islam, who may well have had even Muhammad poisoned. They certainly had Khadija killed, and they also had Ali killed, um, eventually. And, and then the descendants of Ali and, um, you know, his wives were, were, were killed off. And so true Islam surfaced later in the poetry of the Sufis, in the, 
in the minds of the great philosophers of Islam. And we have to therefore reconstruct what the actual meaning of the Quran was. We have to get behind the layers of obfuscation. And the fact is that Ali had compiled a Quran of his own, uh, which was in chronological sequence, like my commentary. But that was ordered destroyed by um, Uthman, who, who wanted to destroy all traces of the actual Quran, really, and just impose his own text, which is what tyrants do. Um, so we have a problem. And that's explaining why the Middle East has been in turmoil ever since. Um, you know, and that's what happens when people don't listen or appreciate or understand the actual prophetic genius and then pervert it and turn it into something that they can make money out of. Um, you know, make a cult about it, make a religion of it. This is what happened to Christianity and how it was transformed from the actual teachings of Christ and Mary Magdalene and the inner circle of disciples into this you know, this other thing, which, I mean, Paul never actually met Christ, and yet he creates this Pauline religion, which is a great business, it's a great thing to be in. And it has virtue, I'm not attacking Paul, he was an inspired genius in his own right, but it's just a distortion, it's a further distortion. Um, and the way that the official Pauline church then went after the Gnostics was disgraceful and reprehensible. And partly to explain why the um, Islam came about. Because Muhammad, in a sense, was, was the desert Gnostics fighting back. <coughs> anyway, you can listen to my commentary on the Quran. One of the sources is this Apocalypse of Abraham. And here's this amazing song or poem. <coughs> And remember that the key idea of the Quran is to emphasize the divine unity. So what happens is Abraham is taken on a tour of the world. He's shown heaven and hell, life, life and death, judgment, and so on. And then the angel who's guiding him teaches him this song or poem. And Abraham repeats it after him. Eternal One, Mighty One, Holy El, God, Autocrat, Self-Originate, Incorruptible, Immaculate, Unbegotten, Spotless, Immortal, Self-Perfected, Self-Devised, <coughs> Without Mother, Without Father, Ungenerated, Exalted, fiery, just, lover of men, benevolent, compassionate, bountiful, jealous over me, patient one, most merciful, Eli, eternal, mighty one, holy, Sabaoth, most glorious, L, 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 I, O, L. You are he my soul has loved, my protector, eternal, fiery, shining, light-giving, thunder-voiced, lightning-visioned, many-eyed, Receiving the petitions of those who honour you and turning away from the petitions of those who restrain you by the restraint of their provocations. Redeemer of those who dwell in the midst of the wicked ones, of those who are dispersed among the just of the world in the corruptible age. Showing forth the age of the just you make the light shine before the morning light upon your creation from your face to spend the day on the earth. And in your heavenly dwelling place there is an inexhaustible light of an invincible dawning from the light of your face. Accept my prayer, my song, and delight in it 
and accept also the sacrifice which you yourself made to yourself through me as I searched for you. Receive me favourably. Teach me, show me, and make known to your servant what you have promised me. I love that poem, that, that song, that prayer. And it's, you know, it's important for seeing the, <coughs> the thought world of Judaism and Christianity and Islam and how they can be reconciled. Okay, so we come to the end. <coughs> I've, I've enjoyed this Sunday's talk here in Thalia, the Muse of Literature. Um, and if anyone's interested in any of the details I've been sharing, you know, contact me. Um, there's so much to say, and I can't say it all in, in one sharing. Although I can attempt. <laughs> um, I'm going to read from my most recent volume of poems. And this is um, volume seven. I've written, as I said, over a thousand poems. Um, <clears throat> this poem is called The Holy Grail. And it's relevant because since I last spoke, we've had the Mary Magdalene Studies Association meeting, which was a wonderful Zoom conference with speakers from all over the place. And some of them spoke about the Holy Grail. As a poetic conceit, it's deep in the heart of European literature, not just British. I mean, Lancelot was actually from, from France, in fact, and the oldest poems of the Arthurian cycle that mentioned Lancelot are all written in you know, the French context. Chrétien de Troyes and the school of um, the troubadour poets were doing Arthurian poems very early. So you can see this as a late Arthurian poem about the Holy Grail. It's number 996 in my poetic works, published in, well, 2020, volume 7. It's called the Holy Grail. To sense cascades, waterfalls, tumbling thus, we come into the world as a dew-drenched droplet of soul, enclosed with trembling, turbulent waveforms of energy. The liquid moisture of our birthing and conceiving our enraptment with the fluids of form. We are water sprites <clears throat> coming into the world in a rush and a gush of joy and glee as the liquid souls of our parents joined in ecstasy. So come then, let us hymn in praise of water and all watery fluids that cleanse and wash that bring tears and bring baptism, that bring the kisses of the beloved. Who is the soul's mother, the birther of being? Come, let us praise Persephone, that she gets out of the dark once more. So let's send Hermes again to go down and fetch her, with our songs. Let each bard, each Taliesin, be true to the far calling of the soul's liquid homecoming into joy. And let us sip from the cup of Christ, willingly, at the feast of love that the forces of hell cannot rise or stand against us. The round table, let it be round. 
Let the knights and the ladies work their magic circles of bliss, and the kiss of the moon on the water, and the chalice which is always given for all time. Let him who can thus sup from the cup of the holiest grail.